Good morning. If you would, grab a Bible. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings 5 is where we'll begin our time of study this morning. 2 Kings chapter 5. Thank you so much for being here. We have visitors with us. We're glad to see you. Uh, and good that we can all be together and worship God, think about the things of God for a few minutes this morning. And I am looking forward to what we're going to talk about this morning as we persist in developing some of our evangelism skills. I trust that you have been having lots of good conversations. I trust that there are some of those little cards that we passed out last week with the clouds on them that have our information that have been passed out to different people around the community. But if you have not, I want to gently remind you or encourage you, as we'll talk about this morning, to continue to pursue having conversations and initiating conversations with those around you. And if you don't have these cards, they are in the back on the, oh, what is it called? Credenza. Yes, thank you, Brother Don. I always forget that word. It's not one that we used in the little town I grew up in. And uh, so uh, on the credenza in the back, there are these cards that you can pass out. I encourage you last week, let's try to pass out five to people that we know over the next month. And uh, if you pass out more than five, we have more. You can overachieve. It's okay. But I just want to encourage all of us to be thinking about that as we think about how we can do more to try to spread the good news about Jesus. There have been some wonderful things that have happened in our lives, and there are wonderful things that are happening in the life of this congregation. And we just want to share that good news with other people. That's all we're trying to do. And so as you do that, as you go out, as you talk to people at your workplace, as you talk to people at the soccer fields, or at a football game, and you have opportunities, just, just take that and remember, you can be an initiator. 2 Kings chapter 5, though, takes us into some different territory. 2 Kings 5, I want to begin reading in verse 9. 2 Kings 5, 9, So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry. And went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Would you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So Naaman the leper, who we talked about a little bit last week on the little servant girl who had recommended or mentioned that he could go see Elisha the prophet down in Israel. Now Naaman has come all the way down from Syria to Israel. He has met with Elisha. And Elisha says, go wash seven times in the Jordan. And Naaman is angry. Verse 11 says, Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. Wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. See, Naaman had got the picture in his head. This is what it's going to be like. He's going to come. He's going to say some fancy words. He's going to wave his hand. And that's the way that's going to work. And so when he says, oh, just go wash in the river. Naaman's mad. Why did I have to come all the way down here to wash in this river? There's also a little bit of racism or nationalism, whatever you want to call it. I mean, I have to come wash in the muddy old Jordan. Don't we have better rivers back home? Why did I come all the way down here? But I want you to notice what happens in verse 13. Verse 13 says, His servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word that the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? The New American Standard has a rendering like this. Had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? And I think that's more of the sense. You came all this way because you wanted to do whatever it took to be healed of your leprosy. And now the command is coming. It's not that hard. You would have done something tremendously difficult, but now he's given you a simple command. Can't you obey it? And so they talk Naaman into doing what the prophet told him. Even though Naaman on his own didn't want to do it, these people, his servants, encourage him, just try it. So I want to talk about how we can be like those servants. Because there are some people who, when we talk about the gospel, they're a little bit like Naaman. The gospel's not really what they expect. Or they, they want what the gospel is offering, but they're not sure that that's how to get it, or that they like how, what they have to do to get it. And so there are people who can help when someone is sitting on the fence, like Naaman was. 
And we're going to call those kinds of people encouragers this morning. And I want to talk to us about how we can be an encourager. Sometimes people are just on the fence like Naaman. What can we do to push them over the edge so that they can become Christians? Let's talk about how we can do that for a few minutes this morning. Even if we're not the people who initiated the study or the opportunity, even if we're not the people who are doing the teaching, we can all be encouragers. So let's talk first about being an encourager by making a healthy climate, a climate that is optimal for people to hear about Jesus. Let's look at a few passages here. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I want you to see how in the first century when the New Testament church was established, when there were people becoming Christians for the first time, how they had a healthy climate for that kind of thing. People who wanted to hear about Jesus because of what they saw happening in the church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 46. Acts 2 and verse 46. The text says, And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. Now, I want you to notice particularly that phrase in verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. That speaks to relationships, that there were people in this group of new Christians who were having favor with the people. The people viewed them favorably. They maintained a relationship with those outside the church. And as they did, that relationship bore fruit because day by day more were being saved. And the Lord was adding them to the church. So what you have here is the idea of relationships that are healthy for this kind of dialogue to go on. Look over in Acts chapter 5. In Acts 5, and verse 12. Acts 5 and verse 12. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. Acts 5, 13. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that even they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least a shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now I want you to notice, again, look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. So the numbers for the church in Jerusalem are skyrocketing in this moment. But there are some people who are not going to join them. They're not daring to join them, but they held them in high esteem. They still have a respect for them, a climate where interactions with these people are positive so that the church has a good voice in the community. People see Christians and they say, you know what, I don't believe that. But man, I know what kind of people those people are. I know several of those people. And so if there are objections that come or criticisms that come, they can say, no, that's not, that's not those people. They held them in high esteem. They had favor with all the people. This is something I can do to be an encourager. I can be an encourager by just maintaining good relationships with other people. You know, our relationships with other people always require maintenance. And this includes relationships with people who are not Christians. Because from time to time, we're going to hit rocky patches in our relationships. Things are going to be said or done. People are going to annoy us or we're going to annoy them. There are going to be things that we're going to have to overcome. We're going to have to make efforts. Sometimes we're going to have to apologize. These are all things we understand as brother and brother relationships in Christ. These are also things that are true in our relationships with non-Christians so that when an opportunity arises, I don't want someone to say, yes, but I know what Jacob really is And I can't stand them because of what happened before. If I maintain those relationships, I am encouraging someone in a way that is very subtle. I am laying the groundwork for that. I understand that this is not going to happen with everybody. That that we're not going to be able to say that we have favor with all the people and that everyone esteems us highly. I understand that there are scriptures that teach us to expect persecution and to expect hostility from some people in the world. What I am saying is that persecution and hostility should be in spite of my kindness and positivity and respect. It should not be because of me. It should be in spite of me. It should be in spite of my best efforts to engage the world positively and create 
a positive climate for the gospel to grow. Turn back a page to Acts 4. In Acts 4, you see a, a case study in this kind of positive, encouraging, a healthy climate. In Acts 4 and verse 36, we read about a man named Barnabas. Acts 4, 36, thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas was so exemplary in being an encourager that the apostles nicknamed him that son of encouragement. This is what he did. This is what he excelled at. And here he sacrifices for his poor brethren by selling something that belonged to him and, and laying the proceeds at the apostles' feet. He does this, and it is an encouraging thing. In fact, it encourages those poor brethren and the church in Jerusalem in general. Unfortunately, it also encourages some hypocrisy from Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5 who do a similar thing. But Barnabas, this encourager, creates a healthy climate where he goes. And so you have a, a scene that we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks here where Paul, newly converted, comes to Jerusalem and wants to join the church, but the church is scared of him. And Barnabas is the one who says, come with me, brother, let's talk about this. And Barnabas took him and talked to them, and Barnabas encouraged them to accept Paul. That's the kind of encourager we're talking about. That's the kind of healthy, positive climate I'm describing. And look in chapter 11 of Acts. In Acts 11, you see how this works in terms of evangelism. Acts 11 and verse 21. Acts 11 and verse 21, describing the work that was going on in Antioch. Acts 11, 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas. Remember him, the son of encouragement? They sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many were added to the Lord. So, the Jerusalem church hears about Antioch, and especially about how there are Gentiles being baptized and becoming Christians in Antioch, and they send Barnabas. Let's encourage them. And so Barnabas goes, and he encourages them, exhorts them, you stay with the Lord, you keep doing what you should. And do you know what happens? When that happens, look at verse 24. A great many people were added to the Lord. It's not just that Barnabas went and, and these people stayed faithful to God. That was true. But now a great many people were added to the Lord. More and more come. Because that's what happens when we have a healthy climate. A climate of positivity a climate where we're going to walk with the Lord and we're going to continue with Him and we trust Him and we believe in Him and we encourage one another and we love one another. A climate that others want to join. That is what Barnabas does. He creates a climate of positivity and encouragement. That's what I'm talking about when I say be an encourager. Do you remember last week I talked about mentions and the power of a mention? Just saying something that invokes the fact that you have faith or draws curiosity out about what we're doing in this church or what you're doing in your life or what you're doing with your family in prayer. Something that encourages people by its mention. But I, I had intended to say this and I forgot it last week, so here I am again. I'm going to say it this week. You know, mentions only work if they're positive mentions. Is it going to encourage somebody if you say, man, it sure, is, it sure is hard to be a Christian. I don't know if I'm going to keep it up. Is it going to encourage somebody to come to church if you say, uh, I, our preacher really stinks? Or, man, our church, it is just dysfunctional. Well, that's a mention, isn't it? I mean, you get credit for a mention. Well, that's not a good mention, and nobody's going to want to come. See, that's not, a, that's not a healthy climate. And in fact, when we mention it in that way, we're not encouraging anyone. We're discouraging them. We're speaking in such a way that we're creating an unhealthy climate for the gospel so that people are not going to want whatever it is we're doing. They don't want to do that because it's making us miserable. But if what we're doing is making us positive and joyful, is changing our lives for the better, then we create a healthy climate. 
A climate that I'm talking about is a climate where it is okay for non-Christians to disagree. They're non-Christians. They don't believe what Christians believe, by definition. So it's okay for them to disagree. It's okay for them to ask questions. It's okay for them to act the way non-Christians act, which is to say, sometimes they're going to be rude, and sometimes they may cuss, and sometimes they may say discouraging and disheartening things to us. But we can still be positive and encouraging despite that. That's the kind of climate I'm describing. The kind of climate that says, because I follow Jesus, I'm going to act like I follow Jesus all the time and always be trying to encourage you to follow him too. I also believe, let me just say this before we leave this point, that we contribute to a healthy climate specifically here at the church building. You know, sometimes we have people who are not Christians who come here. And we all contribute to the climate here. So, each one of us can contribute to a climate where everybody is welcome on every pew, even mine. All of us can contribute to a climate where everyone is supportive and kind. Where everyone, every visitor, every member is talked to, is accepted, is welcomed. We're interested in everybody and not just our own friends, not just those we're closest to. That climate is a climate where people are encouraged and it becomes healthy. And I can do that. You can do that. So let's think about being an encourager by making the climate healthy, not just in the church building, but definitely here as well. Second, we can be an encourager by celebrating small steps. Any small movement toward Jesus can be celebrated and encouraged. We are having a positive mentality toward anyone as they inch toward Christ. I want to show you how Jesus did that. Look with me in Mark chapter 12. Mark 12. <clears throat> Mark 12, I want to begin in verse 28. Mark 12 and verse 28. It says, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Mark 12, 29, Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. Did you notice what happened there? The man asked Jesus the question, and in the other gospel accounts we just read Jesus answering. But here, you have the scribe answering back. And basically saying, Jesus, I get what you're saying. You're right about this. this. These are the two biggest commandments. And then Jesus says to the man, you are not far from the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus says, hey, your answer to my answer was right on. A wise answer is a wise answer, even if it comes from somebody who is not yet a disciple of Jesus. And there is a place for encouraging good things that are happening, even if somebody is not yet a disciple of Jesus. Jesus does that. Have you noticed? Jesus engages people on the level of faith and talks about faith a lot, but almost no one of all the people that he heals in the Gospels, almost none of them do we have any record of them actually becoming his disciples. Have you noticed that? These people just kind of float in and then flow back out. So it's not a matter of, well, your faith has saved you. Now follow me and you'll be my disciple. They don't seem to follow. You've got a, a story of a centurion who comes to Jesus and Jesus says, I've never found faith like this, even in Israel. And then we don't hear anything else about the centurion. Or you have the woman in the region of Tyre and Sidon who is a Syrophoenician woman who begs Jesus and, and accepts his insults so that he would heal the, the demon-possessed daughter she had. 
And, and then we don't hear from her again. Jesus praises her faith and then she just moves on. Over and over again, Jesus says, your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you well. Trust in God. Believe in God. And yet, yet we don't see those people becoming disciples. What we see there is Jesus celebrating movement toward God. That's good. Or here, you're not far from the kingdom of God. I want to show you a passage that I think summarizes that approach in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, when Jesus is described here by a quotation from Isaiah, you have a, a description of that practice, how Jesus seems to encourage the small steps toward him. Matthew 12 and verse 15. Matthew 12, 15, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not clench quench until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. I want to call your attention particularly to verse 20, this messianic prophecy from Isaiah. Verse 20, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. Bruised reed is, is something that was already weak, but now it's been bruised. It's just ready to break. And here is a smoldering wick, okay, just, just the smallest spark. And what this says about Jesus, the Messiah figure in general, but Jesus particularly, is that the Messiah is not going to come and break the reeds and stamp out the flame. Instead, the Messiah is going to come, and when he comes, even the weakest will become strong, even the smallest flame will be fanned into real flame. That's what he's saying, that the small steps will be celebrated rather than squelched. Now, I understand that Jesus at times, at times he challenges those who are interested in discipleship. At times he calls them out about the things that are in their hearts, particularly about the money issues. But Jesus has some knowledge of people that I don't think we can possess. And I don't think that's really a good pattern for us because we can't just guess, I know what your problem is, it's this. Instead, what I see in Jesus that we can emulate is when we see actual acts that people are doing as they move toward Jesus. And we say, that's good. I want to encourage that. I want to praise them for that. So let me give you some examples. When we see someone who is interested in, I want to, I want to read my Bible more. And they come and they say to you, you know what? I read four verses this morning. I can say, that's awesome. When someone says, you know, I've been thinking about this question. And I don't understand how, how God could do this and this. And You know, it's, it's awesome that you're thinking about that, that you're taking your time. I mean, you've put your smartphone down long enough to think about God. That's awesome. When somebody says, you know, I've been making some changes in my life. That's awesome. I want to encourage that. I've been trying to, to discipline myself about the way that I talk. Or I've been trying to be more careful about spending more time with my family and less time focused on myself. Do you hear what those are? They're, they're baby steps toward the kingdom. And, and so when we see it through that lens, then we can encourage that. When somebody is willing to have a second conversation with us about God, that's important. It shows something about them. When somebody is willing to be in our presence while we pray, that's a big deal. Do you see what I'm saying? When we see growth, we encourage growth. That's what it means to be an encourager. Not everything leads directly to discipleship. But I am afraid that at times we view people's movements toward God as sort of like the pass-fail classes I took in college in athletics. I did not want to figure out if I could make an A in bowling because I probably couldn't. So I just took it pass-fail. You either pass it or fail it, and I could pass that. And sometimes we view evangelism that way. Well, you either pass or fail. Either they become a Christian for the rest of their lives, or you fail. But see, what we see here is, sometimes, sometimes there are baby steps that need to be encouraged. Sometimes that's the work of evangelism, celebrating small steps. We can encourage that. Third thing I want to say is to be an encourager, make it easy. 
Make it easy. Acts chapter 8. Let's go to the book of Acts. We're going to spend a few minutes here. Acts chapter 8. I can make it easy on people who are interested in Jesus. Part of what I mean by making it easy is that I can make things clear for people. Because there is some reservation among some about how difficult it can be to be a follower of Jesus. Acts chapter 8 and verse 35. Acts 8, 35. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him, speaking of the eunuch, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said to him, Complete this 15-week course in the basics of Christianity, and you may. Is that what that says? No. You, you may have a, a verse in there that says, If you believe with all your heart, you may. Or yours may just jump down to verse 38. He commanded the chariot to stop, and he went down and baptized him. But I hope you hear the point in what I'm saying. Sometimes we act as though, and people are afraid that. What it means to be a Christian is something that, well, you've got to figure it all out, and then maybe you can become a Christian. Philip made it easy. Philip preached Jesus to him. And by the time Philip was done, and they pass whatever body of water this was, he says, there's water. Can I be baptized? And Philip says, yes. That's easy. That's easy. You don't have to pass the course to be able to be a Christian. You have to be willing to do what God says. And if I am trying to encourage someone to be a Christian, I can make that as easy as possible so that they understand fully. Go with me to Acts 16. In Acts 16, we talked a little bit about the jailer the other day. But I want to show you how quickly this happens in his case. Acts 16, he is certainly what we call last week a, uh, what's the word, interested prospect. And here, he is motivated. Acts 16 and verse 29, the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. So I want you to notice that this man and his family move from presumably not even knowing who Jesus is to being baptized in an hour, the same hour of the night. In an hour. That's easy. If you read the sermon on, Acts, on Pentecost in Acts 2, I understand that it says there Peter preached with many other words, but Acts 2 doesn't take you long to read. Acts 2, you can get through it in about five minutes, maybe ten. Understanding what we need to do to be saved, understanding the need we have for Jesus, is not a super complicated process. And I can help encourage people by emphasizing how easy that is. Now, I do not mean, but please hear me well, I do not mean that being a Christian is always easy. Nor do I mean that the choices we have to make in order to become a Christian are always easy. They are not. I am saying understanding what we need to do and being able and ready to do it is not something that we have to say, you know, maybe in a few months you'll be ready. These people are baptized immediately because they understand and they are willing. And I can make it that easy too if I am going to be an encourager. I want you to look with me in Acts 15. In Acts 15, I, I think there is a principle here that will help us as we try to encourage people who are coming to Christ. Acts 15, beginning in verse 19. Acts 15 and verse 19. This is James speaking, and he says this about this issue about circumcision that we'll talk about in a moment. Acts 15 and 19. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So I want you to notice that idea in verse 19, that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Now, please understand, I, I get the context here is about 
how the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians needed to come to agreement about what was going to be required. What does it mean to become a Christian? Do I have to keep the Jewish law? And I understand that what James is saying here is we can't add to what God expects and we can't put new restrictions on people. I understand all of that. But I believe, and what I'm trying to get at is, I believe there is a principle here when he says we should not trouble those turning to God that he is saying just what I'm trying to say. We should make it easy for people to be Christians. It's going to be hard enough without me making it harder. That's what I believe James is saying. Or, to use Peter's words, we should not stand in God's way. Or to use Paul's words, we should not make crooked the straight paths of the Lord. We should make it easy. Very often, prospective Christians will hesitate to go all in on Christianity because they don't have all their questions answered. And they can't figure them all out. They'll ask questions like, well, what about the Old Testament? How brutal everything was in the Old Testament. Or how can a good God allow evil? Or how can Jesus be God and man? Or what happens at the end of time? And they say, you know, these are my questions. And essentially, until I get these answered and figured out, I'm not going to become a Christian. And that makes the whole process not easy, super complicated, difficult. Here, I can encourage by stressing that you don't have to have all your questions answered before you can become a Christian. In fact, it might be helpful for me to share my story about how I became a Christian, even though I did not have all the answers. It might be helpful for me to say Christianity is about committing without knowing everything. But whatever it is, I want to make it easy because there are ways we can tend to make it hard. And finally, if I want to be an encourager, I need to reinforce the message. This is what Naaman's servants do. You remember how we began with them? They say, Master, didn't you, didn't you hear what the prophet said? It's easy. You would have done a great thing. You just need to do what you know you need to do. That's what Barnabas does when he says, let's continue to be faithful to the Lord. Let's keep it up. You know what to do. Now you need to do it. Paul says, I planted Apollos water. God gives the increase. Have you ever thought about that? Apollos water. Apollos didn't replant everything. Apollos just watered. He encouraged them to do what they already knew to do. And this is a part of what we can do as encouragers. When I encourage this way, I am saying, you know you need to do this. What's holding you back? What can I do to help this be easier for you? I'm reasoning with them through their objections. I am engaging with them in an ongoing way. I've had some experience with this. Because it, it seems to me, in the teaching that I've done, when you talk to someone about Jesus, very often you get to the point where you know the real issues. Like what's underneath someone's hesitation to become a Christian? You know if it's something about their parents. You know if it's something about a life change that they don't want to make. If there's a fornication relationship they don't want to give up. Or a habit they say, I just can't discipline myself in this. And in those situations, when I talk to them, and, and we kind of have a, an ongoing dialogue, I, I don't re-preach the same sermon every time. Instead, what I do is I begin to reinforce, you know what you need to do. What's your choice going to be? And I want to do that with that, that healthy climate we talked about, positivity. And I want to do that by celebrating how they are coming so far along by considering this and working on this. And I want to do that by making it as easy as possible. Hey, any time, day or night, I got a key to the building. I know where the baptistry is. We can do this. But at the end of the day, I'm just going to say, and this is all I can do. All I can say is, you know what you need to do. Won't you obey God? When I talk about this, I talk about the issue of repentance. The Bible talks about repentance quite a bit. Repentance is the idea of a change in life. And repentance looks different for each one of us because we all have different things that we have to change. 
We all have different weaknesses, different life uh, changes that have to be made. But if we're going to repent, that's going to mean very specific things for us. And if we're not willing to do those things, then yes, we're not ready to be Christians. But I want to reinforce that the changes God makes in our lives are for the better. They are for our good. I want to encourage. So, be an encourager. Make a healthy climate. Celebrate small steps. Make it easy. Reinforce the message. We need encouragers. And in fact, we need to be a church of encouragers so that if we do bring someone here and we want them to, to hear the gospel and to become a Christian, this is a place where they can do that because we know we are all going to be on the same team supporting the spreading of the gospel. So let's be encouragers. There might be someone here this morning who needs to become a Christian and you're ready for the first time, you're thinking about some of these things. Maybe you're ready for the first time to put away sin, what the Bible calls repentance that we've mentioned and to make changes in your life, to become a disciple of Jesus. You need to know that as you turn away from your sins and you put your faith in Jesus, you need to be baptized into Christ, have those sins washed away. Acts 2.38 tells us to do that for the forgiveness of our sin. And when you do that, you can be free from sin. You can be a new creature in Christ. You can know the joy and the love and the peace that we have come to know because of what God has done for us through Jesus. But we want to encourage you to do that. And if there's more thought that you need to put into that, we'd love to talk with you. If there's a question that you have, we'd love to study it with you. If there's any way that we can be of service to you, we offer ourselves to you. But especially if you're ready right now to make that step and to become a Christian, please come to the front as we stand and sing to encourage you.